You folks know how to go to church, don't you? And you like good music. You know, nobody likes that kind of music uh, anymore but Jesus and the people. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that's just such marvelous music, and, and I get so excited. Uh, uh, I feel kind of like the farmer who took his wife to the fair. And uh, they were walking around, and he came to a place that said, airplane rides, $25 apiece. And he said to his wife, he said, I, I really would like to take you up uh, for a plane ride, but I, I'm not sure I can afford $50. So the pilot overheard the old farmer, and he decided he'd have a little fun. And so he said, uh, a farmer, I'll take you and your wife up in the plane for free if you promise not to make a sound the entire flight. So the farmer agreed to it, and so they got in the plane, and the pilot took off, and and he went up just as high as he could go, and then he made a nose dive down just as straight as he could go, and not a peep, not a sound. And, and then he went up again, and he rolled it around several times, not a peep, nothing, no sound at all coming uh, from the farmer and his wife. And so he did all kinds of tricks and did everything he knew to do to excite them and alarm them. And finally, in defeat, he just... Uh, he landed the plane, and as they were taxiing in, he said, well, I'll have to hand it to you. I didn't think you could go through that entire flight without making a sound. And the farmer said, well, said, you know, I, I didn't either. He said, you know, I almost shouted at one time when my wife fell out of the plane, but uh, <laughs> uh, I almost shouted a time or two. In fact, I did with this marvelous music. And then your pastor what a glutton for punishment he is. Twelve years in a row I have been coming uh, to preach, and he has allowed me to do so, and you're very kind, and, and let me stand where this man stands. Uh, his 35th anniversary, I couldn't be here, but I got to send a video. And, and uh, you know, what, what do you do uh, when you stand where a man like your pastor who preaches like he does and serves the way he does, what do you do when you have to stand where he stands? Well, the fact of the matter is you just have to do what you have to do. And uh, actually, I've had a lot of experience doing what you have to do. When I was in high school, my mother uh, had a curfew on me. I had to be in at 12 o'clock every night. And so on this particular weekend, I was coming in, I had my shoes in my hand, and I was tiptoeing through the, uh, uh, I was tiptoeing through the, the hallway, and uh, uh, my mother said, is that you, Jerry? And I said, yes, mother, uh, it is. Uh, and uh, it was two o'clock in the morning. And uh, she said, well, what time is it? I said, it's 12 o'clock, mama. And about that time, our cuckoo clock cuckooed two times. <laughs> so I just stood there and cuckooed ten more times. <laughs> so sometimes you just have to do what you have to do. So I'm going to do my cuckoo and get on out of the way, and you can have the real preacher in the building uh, come at a later time. I want you to turn in your Bible this morning to Psalm 51, and uh, I'm going to read the first seven verses of Psalm 51. And uh, then we'll look at a lot of the verses on down through that chapter. But if you would stand with me and follow along in your Bible as I read Psalm 51, the first seven verses for our message this morning. Psalm 51, beginning with verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, the only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. 
Thank you and you may be seated and may God bless the reading and now the preaching of his precious word. Psalm 51 is probably familiar to most of us in the building this morning. It is David's prayer of confession after he had fallen into deep, dark, dreadful sin. When David sinned in that terrible affair with Bathsheba, do you think he ever imagined for a moment that one day God would put his sin in a Bible for all the world to read? Or do you think he ever had the idea that one day his sin would be portrayed on the silver screen and millions of people would uh, watch what he had done? Aren't you glad God doesn't do that when we sin? Aren't you glad that when we confess our sins, God clears the record, he covers them with his blood, and he casts our sins in the depths of the sea? Now, we're given the background to David's confession in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. It is his affair, his one-night stand with a woman named Bathsheba. It is a sordid affair. It is a terrible thing. It is as old as the Garden of Eden. It is current as the experience that people have today. The Bible says about David that he saw, he sent, and he took and he had an affair, and he committed immorality with Bathsheba. And, uh, you know, I, I have a feeling that uh, David said, well, that's the end of the matter. Uh, that was a pleasurable night, uh, and everything's fine. But just a few days after that, David received a four-word note that rocks his world. Bathsheba sent him a note, and she said, I am with child. Can you imagine how that must have made this man David feel? In fact, David spent about a year trying to cover up his sin. Let me give you a Bible principle. You might want to jot down this verse and read it later on. Let me give you a principle found in Proverbs 28, verse 13. That verse says, He who covers his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Now, here is the Bible principle. The sins that we cover, God will uncover. But the sins that we uncover, God will cover. And we will see this vividly portrayed in David's uh, prayer of confession. So, for about a year, he tried to cover his sin. But the last verse of 2 Samuel chapter 11 says that uh, the thing that David did did displeased the Lord. You see, secret sin on earth is open scandal in heaven. So God sent the prophet Nathan to uh, uh, David, as you recall, and uh, before David realized it, realized it, the sword was at his neck, and he heard four more words that ripped the camouflage off of his uh, heart. Nathan the prophet said to him, Thou art the man. And David knew that the sins he had tried to cover, God uncovered. And what was true for David is true for you. It is true for me. It is always true. The sins that we cover, God will uncover. And so David comes now to a very precious place. David lets us in on an experience here that happened between him and God as David comes before the Lord as I hope all of us will do this morning, to confess his sin unto the Lord. Now, when you read these verses of Scripture, I, I, one of the things that's very apparent to me is, is that this chapter here really tells us the high cost of sin. You know, the most priceless thing in the world is the human soul. Jesus said, what will it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? That's the most priceless thing is your soul. But the most expensive thing in the world is human sin. All the mathematicians cannot add it up. All the calculators cannot compute it. The most expensive thing in all of the world is sin. So let's just move down through these verses here in several ways and talk about the high cost of sin. First of all, I want you to notice the high cost of sin uh, in this sense, the high cost of committing sin. Now, you know, we're living in a, in a day, uh, you know, pastor's hard to find an old-fashioned sinner anymore uh, in this culture in which we live. Uh, people just minimize everything today, and, and nothing seems to be sinful today. 
Uh, we're told that sin is no big deal, that, that sin is just the backward pull of an upward good, that, uh, that sin is just uh, an unpleasant bump on the road to man's evolution upward. But God has a different opinion about sin. God says that sin is the poison of satanic origin that has infested the whole human race. That's why David in verse 5 says, I was shapen in sin, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And, and, and so David here is going to reveal to us in his confession the high cost of committing sin. And he uses some interesting words here. In fact, there are three of them uh, in the first two verses that I want to underline in your mind. Did you notice there in verse 1 he talks about transgressions? And then in verse 2 he talks about iniquity and also sin. Look at those three words for just a moment. That's how sin is defined. Number one, sin is transgression. And, and what the word literally means is it means to step over a line. Now, you see, God has drawn certain lines around our life. God has drawn certain boundaries uh, in our life, and he says to us, don't step over these lines. Now, it's not that God's trying to be restrictive. It, it, it's not because God is some kind of cosmic killjoy, and, and he's trying to just kill all the joy of your life. But God loves you, and he knows that if you go outside these boundaries, step over the line, that it's going to bring harm, and it's going to bring misery and hurt to you. So God draws a line, and he says, don't step over that line. 1 John 3, 4 puts it this way, sin is the transgression of the law. Then look at that second word, iniquity. You see that word? It, he says, uh, talked about iniquity, and the Hebrew word for iniquity there literally means a twisting or a turning or a perverting. I don't know if you saw it or not this week, but I was watching at the hearings uh, for the new Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, and one of the congressmen there was pressing uh, Pompeo on some things he had said uh, previously. And one of the things Pompeo said, I'm told he's a, a Christian man, uh, was that uh, same-sex marriage was perversion. And he really was pressing, trying to get Pompeo to admit that. And to his credit, later on, he said, I still believe what I used to believe. Well, friends, I've got news for you this morning. All sin is perversion. All sexual sin is perversion, whether it be premarital sex or extramarital sex or same-sex marriage, all sin sexually outside the bonds the sacred bonds of matrimony is a twisting, it is a perversion. And then look at this little word sin, S-I-N. And the word there literally means to miss the mark. It's the picture of an archer and he pulls the bow and, and the arrow goes toward the target but it falls short of the target. That's what Romans 3.23 says about sin, doesn't it? It says, for all have sinned and what? come short of the glory of God. What that means is, is when we sin, we never hit what we want to hit when we sin. You know, we sin because we think, well, this will make me an important person. It never does. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, you, know, when we, you know, we think it will bring certain satisfactions and certain pleasures uh, to us, uh, but it, it really never does. So sin is transgression, sin is iniquity, and sin is sin. That's how he defines it. But then I want you to notice, secondly, uh, in this about the high cost of committing sin, that he describes sin. You know, one of the best ways in the world to read your Bible is to look for the pictures in the Bible, to see the, the pictures that are there. And, and as you work down through this chapter, you will see certain pictures uh, of, of how sin uh, affects uh, our life, how he describes what sin does to us. You know, we, uh, we, we have the idea that, uh, that, that sin has no uh, real effect on us. Uh, I heard about a mother uh, who looked out of the kitchen window one day, and there her uh, little children were, and they had surrounded a big surfeit of, of, uh, of skunks. And she, she saw there was a real problem there. And so she leaned out, and, and she said to the children, Run, children, run. And they all picked up a skunk and ran. 
And, and you see, ladies and gentlemen, sin smells everywhere it goes. Sin mars everywhere it touches. Sin leaves a stain everywhere it breathes. A, a sin leaves a print everywhere it steps. And David found that out, and I want us to find it out too. For instance, did you notice here in verse 3 that sin affects your eyes? Look at what he said. My sin is ever before me. And literally what he's saying is my sin is staring me down. Everywhere David looked, he saw his sin. You know the guilt of sin. You know how guilty you, 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 you feel when you sin. Well, everywhere he looked, he could see his sin. He got up in the morning, he went to the mirror, and as he was shaving, his sin was staring at him through the mirror. And, and then he went to the palace, and, and, and there those servants were, and, and he saw his sins in, in their uh, troubled eyes. And he looked at Bathsheba and he saw his sin in her uh, sad eyes. And he looked at that little baby uh, that was born and he saw his sins in those little tiny eyes. He saw his sin in the embarrassed eyes of his older children. He went to bed at night and in the dark blackness of the midnight, he saw his sin with a ta ta toothless, gaunt grin grinning at him. Everywhere he looked, sin was before him. That's what sin does. Sin brings its guilt. Sin brings its shame. Sin brings its embarrassment. It affects the eyes. That's not all. Look at verse 6. Thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And basically, there is a reference to the mind. Sin affects the mind. My wife Janet and I, she's going to watch it on, on one of the uh, online. I don't know if she watched it the early service, if she watched it. Now, if you're watching it now, hey, sugar, I love you. I'll be home tonight, God willing, or maybe the next service. I don't know. But anyhow, when I'm at home, we watch the news the, uh, at Atlanta, Atlanta News. You've never seen such in your life. There's murder here, and there's a kidnapping here, and, and there's a robbery here. And, and, and one of the things that just is so striking to me is, is is that some people do such dumb, stupid things. And you wonder, don't they know they can't get by with that? How stupid. But you see, folks, that's what sin does. Sin makes you stupid. I remember one time, uh, Pastor Witz and I, I was in Rome, Georgia, and uh, had an appointment with a, with a couple that was not married, and they both came marching in uh, to my office with a Bible under their arm, and they sat down and proceeded to tell me that it was God's will that both of them leave, leave, leave their mates and marry one another. How stupid can you get? God's will. Sin affects the eyes. Sin affects the mind. Oh, but look at what it says also down in verse 8. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Sin affects your ears. You know, for about a year there, old David... Uh, things didn't sound just right to David. David would hear the temple choir and he'd say, you know, they're off key a little bit. They don't sound quite as good as they used to. And, and he'd hear his friend, prophet Nathan, preaching and say, you know, old, old Nathan, he, he's just not preaching as good as he used to. Some of you sitting right here and you've been critical of the choir. Well, they, that's not as good as it used to be. And you've been critical of your pastor's preaching. Well, you know, he, he's just not preaching as good as it used to be. Uh, but has it ever dawned on you that it might be that sin has affected your ears? Oh, I, now, now I understand there's been some bad singing. You ought to go where I go sometime. You'll know there's some bad singing. Now, some places I go after the singing, I'd rather cry than preach. I mean, really, there's some bad singing out there. And, and, and I, I got news for you. There's some dull preaching out there, too. I've done my share of it. <laughs> one, one Monday... I walked into a cafeteria there in Jacksonville, Florida. Our services were live on television. And, and I walked into that cafeteria on Monday, and I looked over there, and, and there was one of my lady Sunday school teachers sitting at a table with her husband. And uh, he never came to the services. But uh, I, I walked over there to greet them, you know, and to speak with them a moment. And her husband looked up at me, and he said, uh, I, I saw you preach yesterday, preacher. Well, you know how humble we preachers get when somebody says something like that. You know, I'm just ready for the, you know. I said, oh, well, I really do appreciate it. He said, yeah, you didn't have it, did you? <laughs> and you know what hurts so bad about that? 
He was right. I didn't have it that day. I, I've done some dull preaching, but the Bible, Hebrews 11, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, talks about being dull of hearing. Uh, you see, sin blinds your, uh, sin uh, def, uh, stops up your ears to the sweet things of, of God. Uh, that's not all. Sin affects the body. Look at verse 8. Again, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. There's evidence in this psalm and other correlated psalms uh, to David's confession of his sin that, that David became physically a sick person during those days that he had unconfessed sin in his life. Uh, the, the doctors talk about psychosomatic sickness. Psycho, which means the soul, somatic, which means the body, psychosomatic. I heard someone say several years ago that the soul and the body live so close together that they have a tendency to catch one another's diseases. Dear one, if you've got unconfessed sin in your life, it may very well be that it will cause you physical sickness. We see it, don't we, in people's bodies. Uh, we see it in the bloated, the bloated face of the alcoholic we see it in the nervous twitch of the drug addict. Uh, we see it in the lewd stare of the immoral and the impure. Sin will take its toll on your body. I heard about some folks who uh, were touring a rest home and they came across this old guy all bent over, you know, and he had a walker and he was tottering along, you know, and, and someone said, sir, how, how do you account for your uh, old age? He said, well, he said, I, I stayed up as late as I could every night. And he said, I went to all the honky-tonks I could. And he said, I drank all the liquor I could, ran around with all the women I could. And they said, my goodness, how old are you? He said, 22. <laughs> Sin will make you old before you're old. Sin will take its toll on your body. That's not all. Look at verse 10. Sin uh, affects your heart. Create in me a clean heart, O oh, God. David had a dirty heart when we sin. It makes us feel dirty, doesn't it? Uh, you see, sin is to the soul what dirt is to the body. Uh, but the sad thing is, is sometimes we live so long in our sin that we get used to the stench. I heard about a college boy who came home his first visit home, and he said, Mama said, we bought us a goat for our dormitory room. She said, my goodness, said, won't the, the odor be bad? He said, oh, the goat will get used to it. <laughs> we get used to it, don't we? We just think this is the way life is supposed to be. You think that's just the way you're supposed to feel. You've got unconfessed sin in your life, and it's made your heart dirty, uh, but that's not all. Look at what else he says in verse 10. Renew a right spirit within me. Sin messes up your spirit, gives you a bad spirit, makes you hard to get along with, makes you ornery. I heard about two women having coffee one morning, and one of them said to the other, said, do you wake up uh, grouchy in the morning? She said, no, I'll let him sleep as long as he wants to. <laughs> Some of you folks here, all you can do is criticize your church. Some of you people here, you're just as ornery and cranky and hard to get along with. When people see you coming in church, they run in the opposite. Oh, here comes Cranky. Got to go say something ugly, something he's upset about. I heard about, a, I heard about an educational director, and, and one day uh, a member of the church came running into his office and said, I was uh, going through the closets here at the church, and I found three brand-new brooms in a closet that hadn't been, what do we need with three brand new, and I mean, he just pitched a royal hissy fit. Well, it upset the educational boy. He went to the pastor later on. He said, you know, said, man, said, he got all upset about three brooms. Said, why is he upset about three brooms? He said, well, the pastor said, well, now look at it this way. How would you feel if every dime you had given in a year's time was tied up in three brooms? <laughs> Are you with me this morning? Do you... Now, now, I'm not saying there's sin in your life. You just may, you may have a bile problem that makes you bitter. I, I don't know. But, but, but I am saying sin can create a wrong spirit in your life. That's not all. Notice what it says down in verse 14 and 15. My tongue will sing aloud your praises. Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall so forth. For a whole year there, David couldn't praise the Lord. It silenced his temper testimony. I can hear the servants around 
the palace whispered to one another, what's the matter with David? Why isn't David singing anymore? Why isn't David playing on his harp? What's the matter with David? Well, you see, ladies and gentlemen, when you get unconfessed sin in your life, it stops your testimony. I have made this statement, I'm sure, in the years past when I have been here, but I want to impress it on your heart again. Sin will take you further than you want to go. Sin will teach you more than you want to know. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. Sin will cost you more than you want to pay. Oh, dear one, the high cost of committing sin. Now, quickly, I move on. I want to say a second thing. I want to talk to you just for a few moments about the high cost of confessing sin. Did you see verse 4 or verse 3? I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. That's his confession. That's the Old Testament equivalent of the New Testament verse, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what confession is all about. The Greek word in 1 John 1, 9 is homo logeo. Homo, which means the same, and logeo, which means to speak or to say. When we confess our sins, we say the same thing God says about our sin. You see, we, we want to call it different things. We call our sin an accident. God says it's an abomination. We want to call our sin a blunder. God said it's blindness. We want to call our sin a chance. God said it's a choice. We want to call sin a defect. God says it's a disease. We want to call sin an error. God says it's enmity. Uh, we, we call sin uh, an impediment. God says it's iniquity. We say, oh, our sin is fascination. God said it's a folly. We call our sin a trifle. God calls it a tragedy. We call our sin a weakness. God said it is a wickedness, and you're not going to confess your sins until you see sin the way God sees sin. I acknowledge my sin. You see, dear one, when you confess your sin, your mind will abhor it, your will, your, your emotions will abominate it, and your will will abandon your sin. You can't keep your pride intact and confess your sin. You can't keep your mascara dry and confess your sin. And ladies and gentlemen, there are some of us in this building this morning, and you may need to come clean with God and confess your sins before a holy God. The high cost of confessing sin. It's not a simple matter. It's a painful, it's a humiliating matter, but you need to do it today probably, many of you. Now, here's the third thing. The high cost of committing sin, the high cost of confessing sin but then number three, the high cost of cleansing sin. Some more beautiful pictures here in the Bible. Do you see here how he, he uh, paints pictures about uh, cleansing of sin? Look at verse 1, blot out my transgressions. And, and the word blot out there means to wipe the slate clean. In, in those days, they would have... Uh, they would have pieces of uh, uh, papyri or, or something like that, and, and uh, they would have writing on it, and, and they would wipe it off. They would wash it off, and they'd turn the paper sideways, and they could use the paper again. That, that's what he's saying. He, he's saying here, wipe the slate clean. Colossians 2.14 says that Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary blotted out the debt, uh, our certificate of debt that was against us. Ladies and gentlemen, you need Jesus to blot out your sin today. And the good news is when Jesus blots out your sin, he doesn't rub it in. He rubs it out. It's like a debt. It, it's like not only a debt, but, but, but also it, it's like uh, dirt. Verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. The word wash me there is a very vivid word. In those days, you know, they didn't have all the modern uh, appliances that we have. And the, the, the precious ladies would have to go down with the dirty clothes and uh, they would have to get on the rocks and they had to literally beat the dirt out of the clothing. You see, they didn't have a washing machine where all you had to do was just touch a button and it was all done. It was a brutal process. 
And when David confesses his sin, he's saying, beat the dirt out of my life. Some of us, our life becomes like a smelly old football jersey our boy has been wearing at practice all week. And we need for God to beat the dirt out of our hearts. Wash me. It's like dirt, but sin is also like disease. Do you see what he says here in uh, verse 2? Cleanse me from my sin. And then drop down to verse 7 and look what he says. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Purge me with hyssop. What in the world is hyssop? Well, it's not the masculine singular uh, of hiccup. What, what is it? You know, I, I suspect there's some old boy here this morning, and on the way to church, he said, you know, I've been wondering what hyssop is. I hope that visiting preacher will tell me what hyssop is. Well, you're in luck. I, I won't tell you what hyssop. Hyssop actually was a shrub that, that grew in the, in the cracks and in the crevices of, of walls, and, and it, uh, it, it had brushy, uh, it, it was a brushy stems that, that you know, kind of, uh, it was a good to absorb things, so much so that, that hyssop made a, a very, very good uh, brush. And, and they would, what they would do is they would, they, they'd take a wooden stick and some scarlet thread, and they would tie that hyssop to the, to the wood, and it, and it made a, a brush, they, a, an applicator. And he's saying here, purge me with hyssop. And when you read that, it, it takes you immediately uh, to a situation in the Old Testament uh, of, of a disease. All of the diseases in the Bible, uh, they have literal meaning, of course, but, but all of the diseases in the Bible also have a spiritual application. Disease is a picture of sin. And do you know what was the worst disease known in the Old Testament? It was leprosy. Now, when you read about leprosy, I'll tell you that was some disease. I mean, you know, the, the way a person became a leper is, is something. Their, 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 their jo joints and their body would kind of get sore. And, and, and then they'd look and they'd see a little white spot pop up and then other little white spots pop, pop up. And, and then they would become nodules. And, and then those nodules would get soft and they, they would begin to emit pus. And, uh, and, and then, then the leper's hair and his eyebrows and his fingernails would, would fall off. And uh, his, uh, his, uh, uh, his, uh, his voice would get raspy. And his breath, would, he'd begin to, he, he, he. And he would lose all pain and all sensation in his body. And his limbs would fall off of his body and before it was over, his whole body would collapse in a pool of slime, leprosy. But do you know there were times when a miracle would occur? There was no known cure for leprosy in that day, but there were times when there would be a miracle and some leper would be cleansed of his leprosy. And so they would take that leper who had been miraculously cleansed and they would take him to the, to the uh, priest and, and the priest would go out in an open field uh, for a cleansing ceremony. And they would take a wooden bowl, they would fill that bowl with water, they would take two birds, and one of those birds they would kill, and the blood of that bird would fall into the water in, in the, uh, uh, the, the bowl. And, and then they would take uh, the hyssop, they would dip it into the blood and the water, and they would apply it to the living bird, and, and they would, out in that open field, they would let loose that living bird and the the blood would come dripping down on that leper, and the leper would say, I'm clean. Praise God, I'm clean. Now, quickly, go with me 2,000 years ago. Outside the city gates of Jerusalem, there's a man named Jesus, and it's been so vividly and beautifully portrayed in, in picture and in song this morning. 
And there is this man, Jesus, and they begin to drive nails into his hands and, and a spike into his feet. And his muscles begin to cramp and uh, become painful. And, and then they lift up that cross between heaven and earth as if fit for neither. And they would drop that cross down into the hole prepared. And his head would be uh, throbbing with amazing pain. And his eyes would be on fire and his mouth and his lips would be bloody and uh, his lungs would heave and his rib cage would, would bulge and, and pain with shoe and, and uh, nerves with, with shoes of uh, pain with shoes of fire would go running up and down the, the nervous system of the Lord Jesus Christ. What was he doing there? He was paying the high cost of cleansing sin. And in John 19, 29, Jesus said, I thirst. And they took, here it is, John 19, 29, they took hyssop. And they put sour wine on that hyssop and they stuck it on the face of Jesus. And when they did, that hyssop soaked up blood from the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was the blood that made possible cleansing for our sins. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Dear one, it costs the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for you and I to be forgiven of our sins. He had to shed his blood. You see, dear one, it's the blood. We sing about the blood. The Holy Spirit put the service together. There's not a way in the world any human being could have done that. The Holy Spirit put all the songs together to tie into this message today. It is the shedding of blood that cleanses from sin. You sit here this morning and you say, oh, but my sins are too deep. The blood of Jesus goes deeper. You say, oh, but my sin has gone too far. The blood of Jesus goes farther. You say, oh, my sin's too deep. I got news for you. The blood of Jesus goes deeper. You say, my sin is too great. The blood of Jesus is greater. My sin is too strong. The blood of Jesus is stronger. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, you see, the blood had to be shed, but in 1 Peter 1, 2, it talks about the sprinkling of the blood. And you see, ladies and gentlemen, faith is the hyssop that applies what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. So here we are this morning. I don't know your condition. You don't know mine, but God knows both of our conditions. And ladies and gentlemen, you and I have the marvelous opportunity in this service today to claim the cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus if we walk in the light as he is in the light, I quoted, we have fellowship one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now look right up here. In just a moment, Brother Matthew and the singers are going to sing, Just As I Am, without one plea. I ask them to sing that because this invitation hymn is very familiar with you folks here in Charlotte because it was the Invitation hymn sung by Billy Graham all through the years of his crusades, Just As I Am. Now listen to it. Just as I am, you don't have to get better. You don't have to be able to, to change your life or anything. Just as I am, without one plea, you don't have to have one thing to claim, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. And they're going to sing that in just a moment. You say, well, preacher, I, I, I'm not going to come forward because people might think I've committed adultery. No, no. This psalm applies for all sin. It may be the sin of pride. It may be the sin of mistreating your mate. It may be the sin of uh, a bad habit that you have. Uh, it really doesn't matter. You see, it's, it's not just one sin. It's all sin. And in just a moment, what we're going to do, I'm going to have a brief prayer in a moment. The musicians will sing. The pastor will be here and other ministers will be here. And if you would like to come forward, making a decision for the Lord, we'll ask you to come forward in a moment. 
You may just want to come and pray for someone. You see what sin is doing in their life. Maybe a family member, maybe a friend or a fellow worker on the job. And you're concerned for them. You might want to just come like several did in the early service. You might want to be saved this morning. You've never accepted Christ as your Savior. You've never by faith received what he did on the cross for you. Just come to the pastor, one of the ministers, say, I want to be saved. From the balcony, from the sides, downstairs, wherever you are, just come and tell them, I want to be saved. And they'll help you. You may have been saved, want to make it public. Need to be baptized at some point. They'll set up a time. Just come and say, I'm making my profession of faith. You may want to join. First Baptist Church of Indian Trail, just come down and say, I want to join the church. Or you might want to just kneel here or you might where you are. Do business with God about something in your life that ought not to be. Our Heavenly Father, we pray now that you'll move in this invitation. Have your own way in all of our hearts. May we not walk out of here with unconfessed sin in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.